Tuan to give us a speech on her presentation. Thank you. Good evening. I hope all is doing well and still holding on. Yes, please. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your presentation as well. If you could just enlarge it to the maximum, please. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. What an interesting talk that uh, that was uh, with uh, quite a lot of uh, thought provoking ideas. Uh, so uh, my second talk for today uh, is quite an interesting case that I have uh, encountered through um, my review for cases through the colorectal uh, MDT. And I would like to share it because I think it's quite uh, unusual and there's new uh, thought processes uh, um, through um, the review of such uh, a case. Uh, the order of the talk would be, um, I'll present the case history followed by uh, discussion and uh, conclusions. Uh, so the case belongs to a 40-year-old female patient uh, who presented in uh, May 2017. Yes, it's been that long for this case. Uh, she's presented with change in bowel habits and uh, PR bleeding. She underwent a colonoscopy and the colonoscopy showed that there was um, an annular tumor, as you can see on the right-hand side insert, uh, within the rectum. Uh, this was uh, further biopsy uh, proven uh, to be an adenocarcinoma. Uh, the patient then pro progressed as per protocol and underwent an MRI uh, rectum uh, and pelvis, which did indeed uh, confirm the uh, presence of the uh, annular tumor that is uh, present within uh, the rectum. It was 11 centimeters away from the anal verge, and that's quite um, um, an important distance to remember um, when uh, we allude to the uh, discussion later on. It was 3.5 centimeters in uh, diameter and it was um, radiologically staged as a T2 or possibly T3A, so that's an early T3 for a pathologist, M1 with uh, lymph node involvement and M node, so no liver metastasis no lung metastasis, and I would like to uh, emphasize this point. Uh, the patient then underwent a laparoscopic anterior resection. So I share with you on the right-hand side, the uh, laparoscopic anterior resection uh, from uh, this case. Uh, what I would like to highlight is uh, the following. Uh, first of all, that the plane of uh, mesorectal uh, excision in this case was uh, complete and that there was no perforations, as you can see. So it's a nice, complete mesorectal uh, facial plane of surgical excision. And on sectioning of the tumour, as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, the large uh, bowel wall showed uh, a firm annular uh, white tumor, which has occupied the full thickness of muscularis propria, and possibly uh, there's superficial invasion into the subserosal fat, which we can see um, in this area. Uh, the tumor microscopically was diagnosed to be a well to moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. It was staged as PT3, PN note, R note, uh, we managed to retrieve 17 lymph nodes in this case, none of which showed any evidence of malignancy. There were no tumor deposits and there were no perineural and no lymphatic invasion. So I share with you on the right hand side the H&E uh, section from the uh, main resection showing normal large intestinal mucosa and uh, invasive uh, adenocarcinoma. Uh, Originally, when this case was reported, no immunohistochemistry was performed, but with a retroscope um, in line with what developed later on, um, I pulled the case and performed immunohistochemistry. And I share with you a um, CDX2 positivity 
diffuse and strong with positive internal control on the left upper hand side, a negative CK7. And you have to take my word that CK20 was uh, positive um, uh, in the uh, original uh, resection. So all of which uh, confirms uh, the presence of uh, invasive colorectal uh, adenocarcinoma, phenotypically colorectal uh, origin. The only adverse prognostic factor that this case had, this resection, was the presence of an extramural venous invasion. Um, I share the H&E uh, sections with you on the right hand side with the tumour deposit within the um, uh, vein adjacent to an artery within the subserosal fat. We further um, uh, performed uh, dual staining uh, on the section. Um, uh, the dual staining is for AE13 and CD34. So as you can see, AE13, which is an epithelial marker, is red staining and it's highlighting the tumor cells. These are present, the tumor epithelial cells. Um, these are present within a CD31 uh, positive um, venous uh, space, confirming the presence of extramural venous uh, invasion. This patient then progressed to be discussed in the local colorectal MDT and um, uh, following discussion uh, between the oncologist and the patient, it was agreed that the patient will um, um, uh, progress and undergo adjuvant chemotherapy. In this case, it was a single agent chemotherapy which the patient tolerated uh, very well apart from uh, uh, feeling fatigue throughout the course of the uh, chemotherapy. Uh, the MDT also agreed a three monthly MRI scanning in the first uh, year to monitor uh, the area of the um, uh, rectum. Unfortunately, 11 months later from the index uh, diagnosis, the patient represented, and this time she presented uh, to the surgeon complaining that uh, an anal skin tag, which was present throughout the course of the, um, uh, her diagnosis and treatment. So from day one, when the patient presented to the surgeon complaining of the PR bleeding and the change of bowel habits, this anal skin tag was present. At the time it was examined and felt that it was um, uh, you know, a benign uh, skin tag, why bother, let's just leave it there. But since the patient uh, complained of uh, tenderness and PR bleeding, the surgeon decided to um, relieve the symptoms of the patient and uh, excise the uh, skin tag. And what we can see on the right hand side, I apologize, the slide is a bit faded because it's from 2018, so uh, I do apologize uh, for that. Uh, we can see a skin excision lined by uh, stratified squamous uh, epithelium um, um, uh, comprising the epidermis. And then the main finding lies within the dermis. We can see this tumor deposit, it's glandular, so an adenocarcinoma. The things to highlight is that uh, there was no connection with the surface. So this is an isolated dermal deposit that lacks any connection to the surface uh, epidermis. And then once we move on a higher magnification, it's a classical colorectal um, uh, uh, morphological feature with uh, glandular formation and central uh, dirty uh, necrosis. Just note that there is no uh, dual um, um, uh, cell differentiation within within the glands, something that uh, uh, you might find uh, within skin appendageal tumors, which is one of the differential diagnoses in this uh, in this case. So um, uh, we then uh, progressed to perform immunohistochemistry on this uh, uh, skin tag excision which showed a strong and positive staining uh, within the um, adenocarcinoma that is present within the uh, dermis. Um, it showed a negative CK7 staining with a nice positive internal control. 
and a strong and diffuse CDX2 positivity. So this confirmed um, the presence of a metastatic, um, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma of colorectal phenotype morphologically and immunohistochemically. Uh, worth mentioning that within the main specimen, this tumor deposit was completely uh, excised. And in line with the NICE guidance, uh, we progressed and performed uh, MMR immunohistochemistry, uh, which showed uh, normal uh, expression for all four uh, immunohistochemical uh, um, stains, confirming uh, a normal expression or a proficient mismatch repair expression, and therefore minimizing the risk of mismatch protein gene uh, mutation in this lady who is uh, at this time 41 years uh, of uh, age. So to recap, this is a 40-year-old female whom um, we diagnosed with a wall to moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma in a um, rectal uh, tumor uh, stage as PT3 N note, R note with uh, extramural venous invasion. Uh, she represented in under a year's time with an anal skin tag uh, that contained metastatic colorectal adenocarcinoma. As I mentioned, it was completely uh, excised. Um, the thing to note is throughout the course of, we're talking about now nearly a year from the uh, uh, index uh, diagnosis, CT scans showed no evidence of uh, liver metastasis or lung metastasis. So what do we know about colorectal cancer? We know that uh, within the uh, UK, colorectal cancer constitutes the fourth most common uh, cancer. Uh, under 43,000 new cases of uh, bowel cancer were diagnosed in the UK be between 2015 and 2017. Um, and that's the latest data that we have because we tend to run uh, behind. Uh, it constitutes 12% of the total uh, cancer cases in the UK, and um, it uh, constitutes the third most common cancer within male and female uh, patients in the UK. And this is a trend that we have been, um, uh, we have seen change during uh, the years. Uh, so fourth most common cancer, only preceded by breast cancer, lung cancer, and uh, prostate cancer in males. But this is not only a UK problem, as we are all aware of. This is a global um, um, issue with almost 1.8 million new cases globally diagnosed per year, and uh, sadly, uh, 861,000 deaths globally due to colorectal cancer. And we are all aware of common things are common. So the most common site for colorectal cancer metastasis would be the liver being the most common, followed by the lungs and the, uh, to a lesser extent, albeit uh, the brain. So this is quite an unusual presentation for a um, uh, colorectal carcinoma, which was 11 centimeters above the anal verge to present with a metastasis within uh, what appeared to be a, a, a benign um, skin tag that the patient had all through. So how did this happen? Uh, there are um, three and possibly four ways to explain uh, uh, the occurrence of such a rare and unusual metastasis. The first being a hematogenous spread. The second being that could there have been seeding of tumor cells during surgery. So as we know, laparoscopic surgery is quite technical with trokers being introduced through the bottom end. And could this have triggered seeding of tumor cells in an anal skin tag that was just sat there all through um, the years? Um, or could have there been circulating uh, tumor cells that decided to seed into this uh, benign anal skin tag and through the course of um, 11 uh, months grow and develop a uh, tumor uh, deposit. The fourth theory that I could um, add to this is one that has been recently uh, described of uh, uh, dropping, down dropping of uh, tumor um, 
uh, cells due to the effect of uh, gravity in uh, that part of the um, uh, GI tract and that all of that remains a hypothesis that is uh, difficult uh, to prove yet quite unusual. We know in general that cutaneous metastasis uh, from all different types of cancer constitutes 1.3 percent of the skin um, excisions that are um, uh, presented. And out of those, uh, we know that cutaneous metastasis from a colorectal adenocarcinoma in the handful of case reports reported in the literature constitutes up to 6.5 percent of metastasis. And it seems that reviewing the literature and reviewing those case reports that the most common uh, site would be within the abdominal skin and that it occurs in uh, surgical uh, scars. It is felt to um, infer a poor prognostic factor with an average survival of uh, 18 uh, months. Having said that, our patient is still well and alive where in 2021, she had a most recent um, scan uh, in uh, December 2020, and she is um, cancer uh, free. So I'd like to um, um, draw your attention to this case report, uh, which uh, talks um, in general about cutaneous metastasis and then uh, presents um, uh, a kind of uh, similar um, uh, case, somewhat similar uh, with quite an elderly female who uh, presented with PR, PR bleeding and was found to have a PT4 in this case. So quite advanced uh, um, N, uh, uh, N1 uh, tumor uh, within the rectum that was excised. And then within a month, she developed um, skin nodules within the back that were biopsy proven to be metastatic adenocarcinoma. And sadly, the patient died within three months of her um, initial uh, diagnosis. And what I would like to highlight in this case as well, despite the fact that this case had lymph node metastasis, it still showed no liver metastasis, no lung metastasis, and no brain metastasis. And the question that um, uh, I would like to um, ask is, are we really seeing a new um, uh, a process of metastasis in colorectal cancers instead of what's been commonly uh, published? So are we now um, seeing uh, new patterns of metastasis in which there's no uh, liver, lung and brain metastasis, yet there is a cutaneous um, um, metastasis uh, from colorectal cancer? And if so, um, are we talking about new genetic pathways uh, to contribute to this? Just questions uh, to raise. And I know that um, in this case, I would like to um, um, highlight that the only adverse prognostic factor that this patient had was the presence of extramural venous invasion. And I would like to draw your attention to the systemic review um, uh, of um, extramural uh, venous invasion and its importance as a prognosticator in rectal cancers. And uh, the authors of this uh, paper have reviewed uh, 14 studies, which were quite decent sized cohort uh, studies. Um, and two points I would like to highlight. The first is uh, just see this, the wide range of variation among pathologists in reporting extramural venous invasion in colorectal cancer between 9% to 65%. That is quite um, a huge uh, um, uh, you know, uh, gap in this and consistency and reproducibility in the reporting of extramural venous invasion. And then the importance of this comes to the conclusion that most of those studies, 14 of them, um, and this systemic review highlighted that uh, the presence of extramural venous invasion is indeed related to a worse oncological outcome. So unless we get better at um, uh, consistently reporting this extramural venous invasion, it is really going to be difficult to use extramural venous invasion in risk stratification for oncological treatments for uh, these uh, patients. 
And on that topic, I'd like to um, again draw your attention to uh, the publication by the Royal College of Pathologists, and this time it's the data sets for um, the histopathological reporting of colorectal cancer. And in this, um, I think in order for us to develop consistency in reporting extramural venous invasion, we ought really to agree on what constitutes extramural venous invasion. And by that, two definitions have been um, agreed um, um, in this minimum data set. The first being the Talbot's definition of venous invasion in colorectal cancer, and that being the presence of tumor cells within an endothelial line space that has a thin layer of muscle. The second being the orphan um, arteries uh, sign, which is when you see this longitudinal invasion of a uh, tumor just sat adjacent to an artery, um, quite disconnected from the main tumor itself, then that is um, enough for it to be uh, labeled as uh, um, venous invasion, and if it's invading into the fat, then that's extramural venous invasion. Um, there has been quite a lot of developments when it comes to extramural venous invasion on top of the good old h &E slide, which still remains the gold standard, and that's the presence of elastic stains. And um, the, the advice from the Royal College of Pathologists states that uh, should any department have um, uh, a reporting rate, so a frequency of reporting uh, the uh, venous invasion of less than 30%, so we're using 30% as a threshold, then uh, this department ought uh, to consider adopting the uh, elastic uh, staining to improve the um, uh, rate of detection of the extramural venous invasion. And in the literature, uh, there has been quite um, significant uh, um, research studies proving that uh, the rate of um, extramural venous invasion can be increased through the introduction of this elastic stain to nearly 50-54%. Um, uh, in uh, um, uh, our research that I did with the Glasgow uh, group uh, about the elastic H&E uh, stain, we managed to dramatically increase the, ra the rate of detection of uh, extramural venous invasion through using an elastic H&E, which is really cheap. It costs like two pounds per slide. And uh, as you can see, it high, beautifully highlights the extramural venous invasion and its uh, um, um, uh, juxtaposition to the um, uh, thick-walled muscular uh, arteries. So in conclusion, uh, one ought to have a high level of suspicion in patients who have been diagnosed with uh, colorectal cancer um, uh, once uh, we see skin lesions popping um, up right, left and centre. Um, I would like to really emphasise the importance of having a detailed uh, past medical history and past surgical history when grossing specimens and reporting these histological uh, cases. And again, draw the attention to the importance of consistently reporting extramural venous invasion in these uh, in these uh, cases. Um, and uh, again, highlight that there are uh, different methods nowadays to detect extramural uh, venous invasion, especially to help non-specialist um, uh, uh, pathologists in reporting colorectal cancers, whether that be an elastic H&E stain, which is cheap, yet uh, labor intense. And I think uh, consistency is an issue with the uh, um, elastic H&E uh, stain, certainly what I've seen in uh, our lab. Um, and the other method that we've come up with, which is the dual staining uh, with uh, AE13 and CD34, uh, sorry, CD31, uh, to uh, improve the extramural venous uh, invasion. Having said that, um, uh, I cannot escape the fact that, uh, uh, to mention that um, uh, the dual staining is uh, more expensive than the elastica HE uh, 
uh, stain. However, it is more consistent, more reproducible, and it is not as labor intense as uh, the Elastica uh, H&E uh, stain. Thank you, um, and I am happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manal Atwan, for, you, for this valuable information. Has anyone got any questions, please? It was very well explained about extra mural venous invasion. So anyone would like to ask anything, please? Well, we don't have any questions at the moment. So thank you very much for this information. Thank you. Uh, you are welcome. Now we are going to 